welcome back once more. I trust that you're having a lovely evening. And once again, you are watching the Power Talk Show. My name is Cheryl Blessing. And right before we went on our break, we were talking about drug addiction and its intervention. And joining me in studio is Chris Paskimaru, a man who has battled alcohol addiction and eventually got to becoming an addiction counselor and an intervention therapist. So you were just explaining how mm. you went through your journey, how you got into it, and the effect it had through your university, the effect on your work, yeah. and the effect on your relationships with others. Mm -hmm. So right before we proceed with this, I want to bring up the comments that you have sent us on our social media. Um, okay, I'm being told we're going to wait a minute. So you can continue sending us your questions, your comments, your feedback through our social media pages at Y254. Now, Crispus, you were yeah. just telling us that you blacked out, woke up in Westlands, and found yourself at Jerome Rehab, but you went to the mortuary first. <laughs> because can you explain why you were convinced that that was where you were at? What mental space were you in for you to not value your life? Um, I was in a situation where every waking uh, morning, every waking day, I wanted to die. That's how bad my addiction was. And this is something that I, I never explained to the family. Or maybe I, they, they never really understood what, how bad it was. Um, Sometimes if I found myself in a matatu, I would be wishing, why can't it just uh, get involved in an accident and then I die alone and God saves the other people so that people will not say I died out of maybe an addiction or alcohol or something like that. And uh, maybe when walking, I would wish, why can't that truck just hit me? I, I remember there was a time I, I went to, when, was it Thicker Road was being built and then there was the Allsop's Bridge. And I remember, I, um, uh, the la two months ago, there was a lady who wanted to uh, maybe attempt suicide there, and I, I, it triggered those memories. I also stood there one time wishing I had the courage just to jump. It was that bad. That's mm -hmm. the mental state I was in, uh, feeling that I was a failure. Of course, I had been called a failure so many times when, when asking for uh, money from family, friends, when pleading, uh, you know, you'd uh, find your friends, maybe uh, schoolmates who are doing well, and here you are, a graduate asking for alcohol or even 20 shillings just to uh, take some changa. That's the mental state I was in. And even when I, um, when I finally went into uh, Chiromo, um, there was a detox that was done for three weeks, and, and um, my sister catered for that, um, my sister kit. And then we, I was supposed to go to rehab, and then I convinced her that I was fine. And mm -hmm. I stayed for two months and, of course, relapsed. So again, uh, <coughs> it was uh, another spiral uh, down until my mother sent for me and I was taken back home to, uh, to Nyeri. <coughs> that's, that's where another phase of my life started. I thought <coughs> it, uh, maybe when if being close to parents, I would uh, maybe recover. But you see, people in the village knew I had uh, a good job at Safaricom, the stigma, you lost a job because of uh, drinking. And luckily, I got another job now at DSC as a high school teacher. And, and uh, I even started dating somebody, uh, someone, a college mate, a former college mate, and we settled down, kind of started a family, but I was still drinking. And when the money started uh, trickling in again, it got worse. Uh, the women, the drinking, uh, the fights, uh, uh, missing school, absconding uh, duty, the, the warning letters. And eventually, I was interdicted because I just stopped going to work. I would feel like everyone knew I was a failure and all that. And uh, when it came to 2014, eventually I got the courage to maybe go to the suicide. And I remember I saw the TV, went to a bar, drank and all that, and I found myself in a hospital for almost a month. And I was diagnosed with mental psychosis. I was supposed to go for therapy. I couldn't even afford therapy. And eventually, because of the, now the stigma with alcohol, the stigma with the uh, suicide, it even got worse. Again, I was interdicted the second time. And um, eventually, because even my space slip, uh, out of maybe 50,000 shillings, uh, gross, I would only get maybe 9,000 or 10,000. But I didn't want to tell my family how bad the situation was with the loans, the microfinance, the, all those, all those. There were so many problems. And then, uh, of course, my wife had to leave because I don't even blame her. She left with my son and it was her right because it was just too much. Yeah, I had not uh, started dealing with my underlying issues. And these underlying issues, um, they, they could be many. Uh, and every situation is unique. Everyone is unique. Everyone in, in addiction is unique. You yes. have could be having childhood trauma. You could be having low self-esteem and many other emotional issues. Yes. You could even be having a mental um, issue, uh, issue that is causing you to maybe pushing you towards substance use or a drug addiction. 
So um, it got so bad that uh, even when I was transferred, uh, maybe after the, the first uh, interdiction, the second school I went to, I still stopped going to work. I fought with the principal and all that. And uh, eventually I thought maybe I can't go on with it. Teaching, mm. the, 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 my, my, everyone knew I was uh, just this drinking mm. teacher. Kamu alimu, kamu alimu, kamu but how did, you, how did you get through all that? Because yeah. you've, there, there are several times that you tried to stop, you took some months off and then you went back. How did you eventually get to deciding that I am done with alcohol, yeah. I want to turn over a new leaf and become a new person? I can say it was something progressive because um, every time um, the interventions that were being done by my parents, maybe even the prayers, um, I didn't tell you, Cheryl, I would get born again every other uh, two months or every other week mm -hmm. in crusades. Um, and then uh, w w I, would, I would even look for pastors just to talk to me. Yes. So I think it was progressive. And eventually I came back to Nairobi after losing my teaching job. And uh, one day in 2017, February, um, I talked to somebody um, in touch. And he was a counselor, I think, and uh, that's the turnaround. That was my uh, turnaround because uh, he listened to me and guided me on how to go back, uh, go to Alcoholic Anonymous, and and, and uh, that is now where I started networking with other people who are in recovery. Mm. Now, um, I uh, for me to uh, do, uh, make that turnaround, I had to admit that I had uh, finally I was powerless. That I I had tried all other things and I really needed help. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that is something that most people in addiction don't do. They always think, I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. I, every day, because this they is the work I do every control. day, they think they are in control. Mm -hmm. When I finally admitted that I didn't have control, that's when um, now um, my turnaround started. That's when now people came through and started helping me. I had tried stopping many, many, uh, many times before, before, but I never admitted, even to, to myself, to my God, and to someone else, because that's what we always say, I had not owned up that I had, I really had a big problem. But when I did that, and I, I opened up to someone, and I opened up to my God and said I needed help, um, that's when the turnaround came. Then number two, um, I identified what my triggers could have been. Um, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now as an addiction counselor, but I knew I had uh, anger issues. I knew I had uh, low self-esteem issues. I knew I had uh, maybe issues with my family. Um, I knew I had issues with uh, maybe in my relationship. Uh, with, with maybe my first wife, and I needed to resolve all these. And then uh, the sense of failure uh, that I had because of the failures I had uh, mm. in Form 4, I didn't perform as I wanted. In Class 8, Form 4, I, I never achieved what I thought or what other people expected of me. So there were high expectations from maybe even my parents, and I always felt like I failed them. So yes. all these things would combine into a, a, a complex uh, a course of uh, my my Your alcohol addiction. my Why alcohol addiction. Yeah, and then of course there was a, a spiritual disconnection. Eh? Over the years, I didn't have this this grounding in um, in spirituality. So yes. all these things, I had to start working on them one by one. Um, and even when I uh, when my recovery journey started. Um, I didn't have the resources to finally maybe go for therapy and all that. And uh, it even affected my relationships at the beginning. And uh, because, because I really wanted to restore everything to where, where it was, I even found myself going to gambling, you know, mm. betting and all that, football betting to try and win a lot of money again to ruin my finances. So um, all, all my life, I never felt like I was enough. And that's something I struggled with, and even in recovery, until now I was able to um, go for counseling and uh, talk to somebody and learn uh, through behavioral therapy how to deal with my um, uh, that, that uh, low self-confidence. Again, yes. I had a lot of anxiety all my life. Maybe it was the environment I grew up in, uh, maybe the very strict father and uh, very high expectations. I always had a lot of anxiety. Again, these are issues I'm seeing uh, with so many young people. A That's lot of true. anxiety and issues. And they cope with that by using drugs and yes. alcohol because they feel like it helps. Especially weed. Mm -hmm. Now weed is being smoked um, just like cigarettes in the 90s. Yes. Everyone is using weed. And when you talk to these people, you realize um, there's, there's always uh, an issue with anxiety. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, weed, weed, uh, weed can be a depressant to some people, a stimulant and a hallucinogen to some people. So um, at the end of the day, they feel like it's numbing there their pain or their anxiety. Um, I can say I had uh, childhood trauma. I, I had a nice childhood and uh, I can say that my parents were unfair to me or anything, but maybe the expectations I even placed on myself were too high. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. I have I've, I've started working on that, the perfectionism, that I wanted all these things to go my way. Those are things I, I really struggled with, mm -hmm. even in so my working... So you to come to terms with yes, the yes. fact that it's not always going to be perfect and yeah. you just have to accept it. And it doesn't have to go my way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So simple, they might look like simple things, but uh, when you combine them, they, they become a, a vortex of uh, uh, a storm. Yeah. And uh, you have to find a way to numb, to numb them or to resolve them. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think this, this factors, so you're talking about the low self-esteem yeah. and the anxiety and mm. all that, do you think they contributed to the mental struggles that you endured while you were addicted to alcohol? Yes, actually they contributed not only to the mental issues, eh? they contributed uh, to me uh, seeking uh, a solution in alcohol. And even seeking a solution, if, uh, maybe in, uh, in in sex, okay, without yes. without a connection, you know, sex addiction, they contributed because um, when I was drinking, and like other people who were having fun, for me, um, it was a coping mechanism. But it wasn't at the beginning; it was supposed to be fun. But with time, a few months, maybe a few years, I realized this thing was coming me down. You see, alcohol is a depressant; it's not a stimulant. Mm -hmm. uh, it was coming me down. And I was, uh, you know, like I didn't have any care in the world, you know. Uh, I wasn't uh, aware that uh, maybe I had failed or maybe I was expected to do this or uh, maybe I had failed in the exams or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I continued uh, drinking. The anxiety I feel when, when I was uh, sober was just too much. Yeah? So uh, when I drank alcohol, it was like a drug for me. It was like a medication for me. I was uh, medicating uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, one way or the other. Uh, and you see what happens with the time. Um, what happens with the time is you, you rewire your brain reward uh, circuitry, okay? Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, having uh, natural stimulation, things like love or maybe uh, relationships or mm -hmm. uh, enjoying your food and drinks, you, you now get uh, hooked on this drug of mm -hmm. choice, whether it can to be a prescription that, drug. The, yeah. the feeling that you're looking for. The, the high, mm -hmm. that high. And you keep looking for it. Uh, because with time, uh, the brain uh, the brain now gets gets uh, get dependent. Yeah, you and it's also a hormone because yes. certain hormones that release to give you happiness or yeah. give you peace. Mm. So when you get addicted to that and your body is reliant on an alco on alcohol weed yeah. for you to produce that hormone, mm. then it becomes you the way you're saying you've rewired your internal space yeah, yeah, yeah internal uh, mechanism mm. in, in the brain we talk about the neurotransmitters especially yeah. dopamine and that's that's involved in the brain reward uh, circuitry the feel good we for a long time it has been called the feel good uh, hormone or the feel good uh, neurotransmitter any anytime you eat good food anytime you um, maybe make love or anything like that mm. uh, dopamine is released but you see natural stimulant like uh, food or drinks uh, soda, they, they give you just a little bit of uh, dopamine. But for something like alcohol, uh, these artificial stimulants, alcohol, weed, mogoka, mira, give you a dopamine rush. Um. Okay. So your brain kind of uh, it gets hooked with time. Um, uh, but uh, after a few years of using, or a few months, uh, the dopamine will be reduced. That's why you find yourself using more alcohol, what we call tolerance. Mm. Yeah? And then with time, because this, uh, these are chemicals that you're using every day, you become not only physiologically dependent, you also become uh, psychologically dependent. You okay. can't, you believe that you can't do without it. Even Thank though you. maybe you can. You can Thank do you for that, it. because that has given us a very clear example on what leads to addiction, aside mm. from our daily usage. Yeah. It's also something that physically happens to us yeah. in our brain. Yeah. So I want to read some of the comments that you have sent us on Facebook. We asked how you can tell a friend of yours is addicted and how you can help them overcome it. We have Mooney Caroline who says you can know someone is addicted to something if he or she can't do without it. That is very true. If someone is reliant on something, they are addicted. Mangale Madeni Mangale says Vikolani Kwa Amwezi Kwale County is watching. Thank you so much for watching. David Ogilo says, you moderate the level of addiction down slowly until they quit. Yes, that is one way you can help them cope with it and overcome it. Washira Wanjoki says to Kopamoja, thank you so much for watching us. Louis Ebi Lori Ebi Lori says, a person seems to be hallucinating and doing some things. Let them overcome those addictions. Yes, hallucinations is one of the signs of alcohol or drug abuse. Dennis Nyongesa says following, thank you Dennis. Mweni Caroline uh, is the one I read uh, saying you can know if someone is addicted if they can't do without it. Now, we have understood from your story, it yeah. greatly impacted your, your work life and your family life with your direct family, your siblings, your mother, your father, mm -hmm. as well as your spouses. Yeah. So 
how how did those relations get deteriorated through time is it because they actively tried to help you overcome their addiction or is it because they got to a point and they gave up on seeing you as someone who can be sober um initially they they were present they were there they wanted to help um but you see the problem is um, like many other people in, in our modern society, uh, even uh, in our Kenyan society especially, they didn't understand how addiction works. So the way they were helping was even pushing me further. And it happens for so many people in addiction. Even today, you'll hear them saying, these people don't understand me. My family doesn't understand me. My mom, my siblings, they don't. Because um, they think by you know, making a lot of noise, uh, you know, embarrassing you in front of the pastor, in front of the, uh, the rest of the family, they think that is helping. Mm. And they think they sitting they can shame you yes, into sobriety. Into sobriety. It never happens. Um, so for me, because of this scrutiny, at every, at every social gathering, maybe in the, in the family, it was about Chris. Chris is drinking, Chris has messed, Chris has said this. So I would not even attend such gatherings, you see. And then uh, if, if I was calling, it was mostly, I was calling either to con. I had become such a good con. I would even con not only the family members, I would con uh, the priest, I would con the chief. I even conned the OCS one time, I conned the chief. I would con anyone. <laughs> yes, I had uh, such a good tongue. And uh, because of uh, maybe even the things I was saying, my father is sick, you know, I would go in the village, maybe in uh, the town nearby yeah, town lying uh, my, my mother is sick my mother in the hospital all those things of course i had i burnt so many bridges of course i would uh, maybe get drunk and call asking for money if they did give me money i would insult them so i i, I burnt bridges in that way um if they called you now to maybe try and uh, correct me you now maybe help i would feel like they were interfering because you, you see that the, the truth hurts so if they would call me and ask you are a graduate why are you doing this and all that it would just push me further away Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say I'll never talk to you and that I stayed even for years without speaking to some of them. That is how the relationships uh, broke down. I would make promises, uh, I would uh, borrow money and say I would uh, pay back even when working. I wouldn't even from my spouse. And then with my spouse it was even worse because I would steal. You see, mm -hmm. with my parents it was worse because I would steal from uh, the house and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a, a situation that happens with, the, with so many people in addiction. Whether you're using or, or any, any drug of choice that you're using, uh, that always happens. Because you see, um, there the are stages of addiction where you start with this, uh, the experimental stage, you go to the social stage. Uh, sorry, you, you start with the experimentation and then you start, you move to the social stage where you're drinking with other people to move to the instrumental stage where now you're using this as a coping mechanism. Then you go, you go to the habitual where now you, you can do anything to get, uh, uh, get to the drug, the to maintain the habit. Mm -hmm. And then there's the last stage where now uh, you're in the comp uh, compulsive stage where you have to drink to a lock like you're saying. Yes. And I was in that stage. So I could do anything. I, I once sold my shoes in a, in a bar. And um, I sold them to Chako Dia, you know, and I remember the way he derisively told me, oh, let And to me, 180 was like a million. Because a lot. Yeah. That was maybe a bottle that you could drink. Uh, we, we didn't drink from bottles, we drank from cups. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nile, I'm a man yeah, yeah, I'm a now let's start to mm. yeah. If someone is there at the compulsive yeah. stage, because yeah. I am aware so many people mm. have family members or friends yeah. who have gotten to that point. Yeah. People who are even fathers and yeah. have abandoned the children. Yeah. They will sell anything. Like you said, you sell your household mm. items. You lie to your parents. You lie to your friends. You get that you yeah. like maintain the habit. Mm. How will you advise a family member or a spouse to someone who is dealing with someone like that? Yeah. How can they help them? Because you've said they didn't understand your addiction. How can someone understand and help their, their partner? Okay, and the first thing, yeah, you, you have to understand this is a disease. This is a mental health condition. And um, like with any mental health issue, there is loss of control. So uh, the other, if you notice uh, the other person uh, is dysfunctional in one way or the other, in one aspect of their lives or uh, the other, then you have to take control. Um, you, you can't just say they, they are going to turn around one day. Mm. If it's possible, I always tell families, just like you can't leave, if somebody wakes up one day and they start collecting papers in the neighborhood, you have to intervene at that moment. So even for an addiction, this person yes, might be going to work, but they are not in control. So if you leave them to their devices, most likely they are going to die. So I always tell families, um, first of all, try talking to these, uh, these individuals. But have it in your mind that they are not doing it to just harm, or just, uh, harm the family mm -hmm. or just harm themselves. They have a mental health condition. So uh, try talking to them. Okay? If it's not possible, uh, try learning more about 
whatever they are, the, the, the substance they are using. Are they taking Moguka? Are they taking Mira? What is it doing to them? You can talk to a professional as a family before uh, I have seen families come to me to learn more about their loved one before mm -hmm. taking any action. Then, uh, if uh, there is uh, there is there is no change with with, the, with your loved one, then you can just wait. You have to do something about it because there is loss of control, there is compulsion. This person is going to die as 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 uh, as you watch, and you are going to write very good tributes. I always ask families, do you want to write tributes in a few months' time? Why don't you do something? And that's why we have uh, forced interventions. And they do work. I'll tell you, many people have argued that uh, forcing somebody into a rehab doesn't work. But I have seen the highest number of uh, people who would form in rehabs are actually those who are taking their force. Their force how do you force them? Do you drag them into the rehab? Or how do you force them to go to? Because there are people whom yeah. they have, maybe the family has tried this for so many years. Yeah. They have sought counsel, they have sought help, they have talked to the person. Yeah. They've even supported the person financially yeah. mm -hmm. to get them out of that situation. Yeah. But the person, the individual does not seem to want the help that they're being offered. Mm -hmm. How do you force them into rehab to ensure that maybe they can get away from this addiction? Okay, uh, before we even come to the first uh, intervention, there's something I've said. They have, uh, you have mentioned about supporting mm -hmm. um, uh, their loved one. What, what I have noted is, eh, while th there's a thin line between supporting and enabling. Enabling yes. means uh, you're giving uh, maybe resources to this person who is already in addiction. There's somebody who has a mental health condition. You have set up a business for them. You have a uh, Sometimes you, you, you are even finding a, wife, a spouse for them mm. because you're they, paying rent and, paying rent and all that. Mm. Yes, I understand it comes from a point of love and you can do it maybe for a few months to set them up. But if you are doing it for years, then that is nubbling. Okay? Yes. Um, so when, if you're giving support, then let it be support. And it has to be support with uh, conditions. You have to tell them we are setting you up for three months and then after that you have to uh, start uh, chipping in because this is your life. Uh, families don't want to speak about these issues. They don't want to confront um, their, loved one, their loved ones and tell them you have a problem. Mm. Yeah? It doesn't have to be confrontational, you know, like uh, uh, Matusi or anything like that. You can sit down with your loved one and get an, uh, somebody like an addiction counselor mm. and you have an intervention. It has been done for so many in many other societies. It can be done even here. I have done it so many times. You sit down with the family and the loved one and he speaks out or they, uh, they speak out and then the family speaks out and then we have, we, we come up with that. The that's solution. Um, if that doesn't work, that's when we are talking now about maybe a first intervention. It, do, it, it doesn't have to be for every uh, every family. The families who have tried it again and again, you can't exactly. advise them to do it again. Mm. Okay. Uh, sometimes we even tell families to help from a distance. For instance, for instance, you can uh, provide shelter. You can give shelter. Maybe if somebody wants to stay in your uh, in your compound, you can tell them to go and sleep outside. Yes. You can offer. You can love from a distance. Okay. That's I'm talking about true. practical steps. Mm. You can provide them food without an ugly, you know, just food for themselves. But it, you, can't, uh, you can't tell me that you provide food for, the, uh, for them and their spouses and all that. Um, what I have found at uh, work is communication. If we are, we are to improve communication, the way we communicate with people in addiction, mm. um, I, I only find it um, working more than even forcing people to go to rehab. Uh, you sit down with them, you talk from a point of love, from a point, not from a point of um, higher moral authority. Because that is what we do. We That's talk true. down on them. Uh, mm. uh, and you know, them. we have, to, to, you know, we have taken to eight rehabs. This is a man we could have used to buy a matatu. This, this is a, like a plot of shamba. You don't. If you do that, eh, you're just pushing them away. Okay. Mm. You have to start listening to maybe the loved one. Yes, you can say it's his life, it's her life, but it's affecting you. This is a family disease. True. If you don't get better, then all of you will stay sick. Mm. They have to. Your loved one has to get better for everyone in the family to get, to get better. better. So if you approach it from uh, maybe the professional assistance or with some love, mm, you tell them the what, what you want. Ex yeah, with that compassion and empathy, mm. not sympathy, empathy. You pr please try to understand where they are coming from. Could they maybe have gone through something that they don't want to tell the family? Because you find, uh, for instance, a, a boy who was sodomized in, in primary school or in, in high school, they, you don't expect them to come and tell you. Yes. So sometimes, even as families, we need to appreciate that some things could have happened to the person in addiction that they that might we not, not share. Aware of. Okay? They, mm. We are not aware of. Mm. Uh, that's, that's when we now start considering something like uh, professional counseling. Yes, because yeah. they may open up to a therapist yes. as opposed to open up, yeah, opening up to you. That's a new
neutral person and then they are tied down by a uh, confidentiality clause. They will yes. not go revealing uh, all these things. Mm. Okay. I'm talking about uh, techniques I've seen work mm. practically. Yes. Yeah. There's, you know, there's Those a lot are of very practical. Yeah. And you know that's the, that's what we need because yeah. the practical steps that you can do are yeah. what help, not the theory. Yeah. Now you've also mentioned, you've, you've mentioned this a few times, okay. with the family shaming you and people even in society mm. seeing you as a failure, seeing you as a, an addicted person who's just a burden. Yeah. What are some of the misconceptions that people have about drug addiction that push the addicts further into the addiction itself? The first one is it's a, it's a choice. You're the one who goes to the bar. You're the one who buys uh, mugoka. You're the one who buys weed. So you're in control. Chris, you're the one who, uh, you know, who buys prescription drugs. You are in control. You, you, no one, no one, and I have heard so many parents saying this, eh? no one brings the alcohol to you. Mm. Okay? And that argument comes, uh, comes in because we have not accepted that this is um, addiction is a mental health condition. You see, there's the normal drinking. People have, alcohol has been there. Uh, some of these drugs have been there. And some people drink and manage their lives properly yes. without any problem. And then the addiction. With addiction, there is loss of control. Total loss of control and that compulsiveness. This person can sell their shoes. This person will have to drink in the morning. This person will have to drink in the evening. Yes, they are working. They are in a suit, a good suit, but they have to work in the, uh, to drink in the evening. Mm. So um, telling them that it is a choice, um, then that's a myth, that's a misconception. I don't, I don't see anyone who would have liked to find themselves at 5 a.m. knocking on a barmaid's uh, window to, uh, to beg for alcohol. Mm. I don't see any graduate who have liked to go begging uh, a drug peddler for, mm. for a short or, or something. Or even pass out. And the way you said, yeah. the first step to your recovery was you accepting that it was not in your control. Yes. So it wasn't your choice. You were driven by the addiction. It's the urge and the yearning for yeah. alcohol, a sip of alcohol that drove you to drinking and buying all these things. And the underlying issues. Mm. The issues that I want to numb. Mm. Uh, are the ones that uh, spiraled into, into the addiction. Into the addiction. When I started working on them, for once, um, I found myself going for a month, for the second month, for the third month. Uh, I was able to maintain a relationship for some time. And I found myself now with that conviction that, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to drink again. Another myth is that uh, it's a curse. You are cast. Your family is cast. It's these, uh, your family, and you know, so many things. Yes. And, um, and even in the African society, they say it's Ushawi. Yeah. Umerogwa. Ushawi. Umerogwa. Uh, yeah. Mm. And that's another misconception. And another one is you, they can stop anytime they want. Mm. You can stop anytime you want. And I hear even, uh, even in church and so many other platforms, you can stop anytime you want. If I really wanted to stop, I would have done it um, maybe many years ago if it was that easy. Uh, why would I have um, waited until losing my job at Safaricom, losing my job at TSC, losing my family, losing all those things, good things? Why would I have waited? I would just have stopped if it is that easy. That's why would true. somebody with uh, maybe uh, liver disease wait until they are dead? Okay. <laughs> uh, why would they continue drinking? And it's even true even because there are people who have drunk to the point of even getting the liver disease. Yes. And even with the condition, they, they will continue. seek out some drugs or alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not within, they can't stop. It's just something that they have to talk to someone about yeah. and get over the addiction progressively, mm. as you said. Yeah. Now, I also want to, the youth of Kenya, if we're being honest, Kenyans have a very bad habit. I witnessed this personally once mm. in a club. Yeah. Someone was blacked out. Okay. And because it's his birthday, his mm. friends are still chugging alcohol down his throat and pouring water, getting him up. And this person has passed out. The Kenyan culture has promoted and glorified alcohol and drug abuse and even this usage of mira, tobacco, velo, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. How would you advise someone who's right now maybe dealing with the wrong group of friends or getting into addiction without realizing how can they stop as early as now before they lose 20 years of their lives and their families and jobs and so many other things? I don't know whether we have time, but um, these are diagnosed uh, DSM-5 or some criteria we use mm. to maybe, uh, it, maybe this one's for alcohol. Um, mm. if we can just maybe highlight yes, briefly. Just, just to highlight, yes. if you have tried to stop uh, maybe the drug you're using and uh, unsuccessfully, if you are taking it in larger amounts and for longer, if you have cravings, if you have um, higher tolerance, you're using more than, you than when you started, if you're using despite negative consequences, uh, even in situations where it's uh, physically hazardous, maybe you have found yourself in such a bar, you're blacking out, all these are signs that uh, you have a, a substance use disorder, what mm. we call SUD. Mm. Okay? You have, you're most likely addicted and you need to, see, uh, to seek help. If you have withdrawal symptoms, that shows that um, uh, mo most likely you're dependent on this substance that you're using. Mm. It could be prescription drugs like uh, uh, Valium and many others, benzos. 
and uh, it could be alcohol, it could be any, any drug. Yes. It shows that uh, you need help. Mm. Yeah. So, so this is a questionnaire or something? Um, this is what we call DSL-5. There are so many uh, screening tools that we use, uh, mm. like Cage, and then there's Must, and then uh, most of these are even online. Yeah. Um, uh, this audit, audit uh, these are tools that you can download. You can tell and yeah. see. And I, f I hope back home you're taking note of that. The, the one I've noted is DSM-5. I will encourage you and your friends, sit down, take this, this test and figure out, are you addicted? How can you work on that and how can you prevent it before it gets too far? So because time is running out, yeah. you could give us your parting shot and then share your contacts because there's so many people who would like to be able to access you. So just give us a parting shot and then your details, your social media, your phone number if available yeah. and some way that we can find you. Uh, simply, don't die alone. If the substance you're using, if the drug you're using is affecting any aspect of your life negatively, if you have had to borrow money to hide when you're using that substance, if you have had to maybe uh, take a leave, uh, a sick leave from work, if it's affecting your relationship, it's time to get help. Talk to someone, get help. Yeah, um, you can reach out to a, a professional counselor. You can reach out to maybe some late recovery, a recovery coach. Um, there's Alcoholic Anonymous. Well, these are meetings you can just walk into that they are all over the country and you can even Google them online, Alcoholic Anonymous meetings. Uh, you can walk in and start connecting with people who can help you. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, uh, we even have um, uh, mental, mental, mental health hotlines where uh, you can even walk into any government hospital and you'll find a mental health department and you can ask for counseling services. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are even offering, uh, even in Nairobi, they are offering free, yes. um, um, uh, you know, counseling services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For my contact uh, on social media, um, on TikTok, on Facebook, on um, Twitter, I'm Chris Kim Recovery. Chris Kim Recovery. If you just search that, you'll see my content and uh, you can we can you can DM and we can talk. Yes. Uh, my number, no, my mobile phone number, it's uh, 0726 619 That is 0726 619 yeah. Thank you. You can reach out. Please don't die alone. Mm. And there's hope. I, I think uh, I epitomized that. Yes. I was down. I was uh, rejected. I had given up even on myself. But here I am talking about tra uh, spreading the gift of sobriety. Thank and that you is what that. I do every day. Thank you. That was very wonderful. I love the testimony of his journey of overcoming. You saw how he started. It was just a fun thing that he did with his friends, but it led to 17 years loss in all this addiction and so many things that could have gone different that were baby blindsided and uh, uh, overcome by the addiction. So. I'm just being told time is running out. But thank you so much for yeah. tuning in. I hope that you seek the help that you need. And uh, you get help for family members, friends, and anyone. Thank you once again, Chris Bass. Thank you for the entire team. Timo, Rose, the technical team, the camera operators. Thank you for helping this show run smoothly. We will have a repeat of this show tomorrow between 1 and 2 p.m. And it should also air on our YouTube page. So stay tuned for that. So you can also find me on social media at Sherry Blessing. And that's it for today. I hope you've gotten something from this conversation. And if you haven't gotten anything, please uh, do not die alone. That's the only thing I can tell you. That's it. Thank you. Stay tuned to Y254 TV.